Well, we're going to begin a, a new series here for the Advent series uh, season, and uh, I call it putting a different spin on Christmas. Uh, I do that because I think you all know the Christmas story. It goes like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. How many have heard that story before? <laughs> All right. Now, some of you didn't raise your hand. And so uh, I'm going to have to preach to this side because I saw a lot of hands not go up. Uh, come on now. How many of you have heard this story before? All right. Yeah, this, this is a great, great Bible, Bible story. It's the story about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want to put a different spin on it because you've heard the story and probably have heard it every year at the Advent season. You've heard the story. So I want to put a spin on it from the book of Hebrews, a Hebrews perspective of what took place at Christmas. And to do so, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 1, and there it begins by telling us that the Christmas story about Jesus is superior to all other stories. This is the best, the greatest story ever told. It's a great story. And that's what he wants. He wants to say, this is superior to everything you've ever heard before because this is what he says. Jesus is the Son. That's powerful. I mean, when you think about it, that God came down and became one of us, it's almost like, you got to be kidding. God in a manger? This is like the craziest thing you've ever heard. Why would an almighty God condescend and, and be born of all places? out with the animals in the barn, in a stall, in a manger, which was a feeding trough. My goodness, this is, this is almost unbelievable that God would do that. Well, let's begin the passage here. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers. Yeah, he spoke to Adam, he spoke to Noah, he spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and we could just go down the list. He spoke to all the, the kings and, you know, all the way through the Old Testament. He, he spoke to all of them. And he says, and he spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. Now, there's the major prophets and the, the 12 minor prophets. And we got 17 of these prophets listed in the Old Testament. But there were even more that weren't even recorded. And a prophet is somebody that God speaks directly to, and then he gives the message. And he says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets many times. Over and over, God sent someone to them. He sent a prophet. I was reading in Samuel, and there's a, in 2 Samuel, I mean, 1 Samuel chapter, I think it's 2 or verse three, uh, chapter 3. At the very beginning, it says, And the word of God was rare in those days, because there were not many visions or dreams. It was rare. It, it was sparse. So every now and then, God would intrude in time with a prophet, and he would bring a message. And he says here, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets many times and various ways. Sometimes he heard an audible voice, the prophet, and then he passed that on. Sometimes he had a vision, and he passed that on. Sometimes it was in a dream. He was asleep, not awake while he was seeing what he was seeing. And God spoke to him. Sometimes it was with writing. One time a hand appeared on the wall and wrote some letters on the wall, and God was speaking. Sometimes it was through miracles, but God was speaking. He did this many times over, in our Bible alone, over 1,500 years, even longer than that. It took for the, the Bible to be written as we have it today through 40 different authors 
We, we have a Bible with 40 different authors over 1,500 years. We got this one record, a harmonious whole, a story, and he said, man, this is, this is an awesome book. Now, I've enjoyed going through the book of Judges in the last, uh, this last fall season. We went right through the whole book of Judges, but the stories there, they were awesome, <laughs> but this is what he says. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by Son. Son. To make this make sense in English, most translations have put another word in there, the son, his son, a son. But the Greek text really just says son. He's spoken to us by son. You see, he's contrasting him to forefathers, and he's contrasting him to the prophets, and he's trying to say the quality of the person is so much superior. This is the Son of God. That's what happened in this manger. The Son of God took upon him humanity so that the child was born and a son was given, Isaiah says. Notice also it says, in the past, God did all these things. But now it says, but in these last days, when Christ arrived, we entered into a period called the last days. And we're still in that period, the last days. We're in the days of the arrival of the Son of God. And he says, the reason why everything is so superior, his message is superior because the person who delivered it is superior. He is a son. He is superior also because he is the heir. He goes on, says the very next part of the phrase, and the very next phrase says, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now, you know what it is to be an heir. When my parents passed away, they had made out a will, also a trust, and the things in that will and trust laid out who the heirs, who would receive the benefits of all that my parents had accumulated in their nearly you know, 85 years of life all the stuff they accumulated, and we had an executor of the will, which was my older brother, and then there was a disbursement according to that will of everything. And the text here says, the father has appointed this son in a, in a manger. He has appointed this son the heir of everything. Everything belongs to him. Now, I know some of you got Christmas lists, and you're wishing to get something for Christmas. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, you're wishing to, to get maybe a new car, all right? Oh, you're not thinking that big? Okay. Um, you're wishing to get a new washing machine. <laughs> all right. All right. You're, you're, you're wishing to get a new pair of shoes, right? <laughs> Something. All right. but, but you have this thing. You, you have this wish. And once you receive that, you say, ah, it's mine, Right? I want to tell you something. It's not yours. It's not. This text says, God appointed him heir of everything. Everything you have, everything you are, belongs to him. Belongs to him. In the Old Testament, it said it like this. All right? It's in Psalm 2, David, a Psalm of David. He says, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, referring to Jesus. Today I have become your father. I became a father the very same moment my son became a son. And so it has nothing to do with pre-existence or anything. It's about relationship. Father-son is relationship. Being an old man and being a young man, now that's about time. But being a father and a son has nothing to do with time. It has to do with relationship. He says... Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The Messiah will own all the nations. You know a day is coming when King Jesus is going to return. He's going to take up his throne and he's going to rule with a rod of iron and he's going to rule the whole earth. King Jesus will inherit every nation on the planet. It's going to happen. But the next part, the ends of the earth are your possessions. 
Everything that is on planet Earth belongs to him too. That includes your car, your refrigerator, your washing machine, your shoes. That includes you. He gets it all. This son is born in a manger. Isn't that amazing? Everything is his. Because everything is his, he can offer whatever he wants to you and me. And one of the things this son offers is an abundant life. <clears throat> Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus wants you. The reason why he came, he invaded earth and he came in the manger was so that you could have an abundant life, a fulfilling life, a worthwhile life. Have a life that you live to the full. To, to the full. That you have a purpose, you find that purpose, you live that purpose, and you are fulfilled in life. Not only did he come so that you would have this blessing right now, but he has said to, him, he said to us, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. He who owns everything, he says, if you receive me, I give you eternal life. Oh my, it doesn't get any better than this. You get the good life now, and then you get it forever. Forever. Jesus is the heir. Second thing he sees in the passage, we see in the passage is this. And through him, he made the universe. Some translations have he made the world. Some have he made the ages. Actually, the word is a time word. And then this has got me really going because uh, I, I, I've been reading on time. And my wife knows because I've been sharing with her my thoughts. I'm reading a book on physics about the history of time by Stephen Hawking. Anybody who know who Stephen Hawking is? You know, he died not too long ago. Uh, the most brilliant physicist probably in our lifetime. Uh, some of you are older might say Einstein was. Uh, but you do have a little debate going on there. Anyways, he builds on Einstein's theory. But the thing about about Hawking's is he, is he, he pretty much for the scientific community proves that time and the universe is called time-space. They're one. The Bible had this right all along. To say that he's the creator of time is to say he's the creator of the universe. To say that he's the creator of the universe is to say that he's the creator of time. I like that. God, the creator who made, through Jesus Christ, Jesus was the agent that made time, space, the universe. Of course, um, Hawking believes it was a big bang and that everything at one time was compressed down, everything that exists was compressed down into a tiniest little compressed matter that had such infinite, there's the word, infinite gravitational por force that it was singularity. Now, what is singularity? I've been trying to nail that one down for a long time. You know what we call it? Eternity. What he's basically saying that everything that is in a bang came out of nothing. He even goes so far as to say there was nothing. You can't even talk about what happened before this point of the bang in singularity. You can't, you can't go... You can't talk about anything before that because none of the physics of this world works because they weren't there. So what was it? It was just one steady, constant state of, and I can't fill that part in. Because he is so much against God, I just keep wanting to say, I'm screaming at my book. It's God, you brilliant idiot. <laughs> it's God. It's the cre He's the creator through him. He made time. In the book of Acts, it says, in him we live and we move and we have our being. Time is not something outside of God. God is eternal, and it's something he created within himself. So in him we live, move, and have our being. We, in our Bibles, have the answers to the questions that these profound physicists are trying to describe, but they could never bring themselves to say, it's God. <laughs> in this major... It's the creator. Now, this is mind-boggling to me. This, this blows me away. 
He created the body he's in. Is that amazing? He creates the baby's body that he is in. I say all this because I want to make an application to you. Since the Creator came into the world, He came for a purpose, Jesus makes no mistakes, and He placed you in the present age in which you live, the now. Not by accident, but by divine design. And He made you, as the Creator, He made you to be uniquely you. No one else is like you. I have a brother, we look a little similar, but man, we are so different. You can take two identical twins, and they're still not identical. Because there's no one else like you. He made you to be you for a time such as this. For the 21st century, he made no mistake. He didn't put you in the 15th century. He's not going to put you in the 23rd century. He puts you right now in order to accomplish his unique plan for your life. You can only uncover that as you build a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, hearing him speak to you directly through this book. You find what he wants for you to do, and you achieve the abundant life now and eternal life to come. Isn't this awesome? He, he's finding a lot in this Jesus that came. The third thing that we find in this passage is, he is the, the Son is the radiance of God's glory. The effulgence of God's glory. One, one person I read this week about this passage said, Jesus is like the ray, and the Father is like the sun. You can't have the ray without the sun, and you can't have the sun without a ray. They so link Jesus here, though, he's saying that he radiates the effulgent glory of God. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Every attribute that God has, he has. Characteristic. He radiates that. And so that it tells us when the word, Jesus Christ, the second person of the eternal trinity, became flesh, he dwelt among us. And then John adds this in John 1.14. We beheld his glory. That made early artists paint Jesus with a halo. <laughs> you know, put a, put a halo around him, a glow. Because this, they, they take this literally that there was an effulgent glory going up. Now at the transfiguration of Jesus, he really did glow in a future glory. But Philippians tells us that when he came into the world, that he laid aside that glory. He emptied himself of that manifest glory of which no man could look at it and live. He laid that aside and be, he took upon him the form of a servant and he was made in the likeness of men. There was Jesus. Glory, his glory was, being, was still there in a degree, but the full effulgence of it was, was emptied, lessened, so he could walk about among us. I don't think he glowed. I don't think he had a halo on. So even when I draw them, I'll, I'll still put the halo on. That's so you know which one of my figures is Jesus. Otherwise, you say, hey, they all look alike. Well, as soon as I put a halo on, oh, that one's Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but he has this radiance of glory. Now think about this. He has the radiance of glory. And the Bible says he dwells in our hearts by faith. The glory of the Lord can manifest itself in my life, and your life too. That's why the scriptures say this. When Jesus invades your life, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He's not asking something you can't do, bring glory to him, because the one who is the glorious one resides within you by faith in your heart. When you believe, the glory is there. You can change your life in such a way that whatever you do, you do it for his glory. That's all wrapped up in the manger. Fourth thing I say in this passage is that he is a representative. The son is a representative. 
the prophets and the forefathers, they weren't. It says he is the exact representation of his being. Some translations will have essence. It is his immaterial substance. I don't know how else to describe it. It's, you know, we have a body and then we have a spirit. That immaterial being. Jesus is the exact representation. So I got the die up here of an ancient die, and what they would do is they'd use that to stamp things, and out of it, each one would look alike. Boom, boom, boom. And what the text is saying is that Jesus looks exactly, the spirit of Jesus, looks exactly like the Father, who looks exactly like the Son, except they're invisible, you can't see them. They're the exact representation. They, they are one and the same. Each person is God. Jesus is that representation. So it doesn't surprise me when the, prophesy, the prophet Isaiah says uh, that his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then when Jesus is born to fulfill that prophecy, they say his name is Emmanuel. And by that, the name is actually a sentence. God is with us. Because God was the person in the body of Jesus. And so, so, it's so it's so real that Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And what I draw from this is if we're ever going to have a relationship with God the Father, we're going to have to do it through the Son because he's the exact representation. If you want more, he's always going to say, just look to the Son, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Jesus is the way to the Father. And the passage goes on and says, this is a superior message, this, this Christmas message, because he's sustaining all things by his powerful word. The word sustaining means to bear along. So it's to carry. He is lifting up the entire universe and he is carrying it to its destination. He's, he's taking it where he wants it to go. And he's doing it by his powerful word. His powerful word. The whole idea that, it, that he is carrying, it's because he is actually holding everything together. Now, in, in, in Stephen Hawking's uh, a history, a brief history of, of time, um, he talks about the Big Bang and uh, the entire universe, how the universe came and it was compressed down to this one little thing at the beginning of the Big, big Bang and, and, and all of that. And he says, well, if we're going to have to, if we're going to study physics, we've got to go not just large universe, we have to go small, tiny. And so they study atoms and they study quarks. How many are familiar with quarks? <laughs> you know, little quarks. I'm reading along and I, I discover something that Stephen Hawking's most brilliant physicist of, of my lifetime. He is both a scientist, he, he believes in the science of physics, and he believes in the religion of physics. I said, what do you mean he believes in the religion of physics? Well, I'm reading along and all of a sudden he ships gears. He's stating these facts and all of a sudden he says, it is believed. I said, what? It is believed? What is belief? And then he, he starts theorizing because the truth is he didn't know. He doesn't know. And then later he'll say, I'm not so sure that there won't come another theory that will replace my theory. <laughs> and so he says he really doesn't have absolute truth. He's shooting in the dark. Well, we're on quarks. This part that really got, got me. We're on quarks. You've got to explain an atom. There's an atom with a electron flying around it, right? I've never seen one. Anybody here ever seen one? No, we haven't seen one. Okay. You've seen one? No. I, you're pulling my leg. You've never seen one. There's an there's a electron flying around the proton and the, the neutron that's at the center of this thing, and they're in different configurations. And then, but those, everybody thought that was the smallest thing there ever was, the atom. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, no, no, there's something smaller than the atom. It's quarks that make up the neutron, the proton, and, and there's multiple quarks within one. And then the, the most amazing thing is he's writing and, and, and telling how they don't know how it holds together. And so what do they call it that holds it together? 
They call it the strong force. And may the force be with you, too. <laughs> the strong force. My Bible tells me that God is sustaining his universe as big as it is. But in this passage in Colossians, it says, For by him, Jesus Christ, all things were created. He's your creator. We've been establishing that. Things in heaven and earth. This is a Hebrew mirrorism. They don't have a word for universe in Hebrew, so you take extreme opposites, the heavens and the earth, and that covers everything in between. It's the word for universe. It says the entire universe he created. Then he says visible and invisible. Well, I can't see that atom, but he made it too. I've never seen a quark. They haven't either. Never saw one. But I think he's probably talking about another dimension, whether thrones or powers. These are titles of angelic beings which have no body, but they have a spirit. Whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, these are all titles. All were created by him and for him. You know why God created you? For his own good pleasure. God wants to be pleased in you. That just blows my mind. I can make God happy. Isn't that great? You can too. Here's the next part I like. He is before all things. He's the eternal one. And in him all things, here it is, hold together. So I'm reading along and I'm wanting to scream at this book that Stephen Hawking's strong force. I know him. It's Jesus. King James says, in him all things consist, hold together. He's the one who's holding it all together. Listen, it is this God, this Jesus, that was laying in the manger on that Christmas morn. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Sixth thing that he says, man, he's just like a rapid fire shooting these out, boom, 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 boom. He's just shooting one right after the other. He says, and after he had provided purification for sins. Now we're getting to the heart of the whole book of Hebrews. He's trying to make a case you don't have to bring an animal sacrifice before the Lord anymore because there was one sacrifice made once for all forever where Jesus sacrificed himself once for all. You don't have to do it over and over and over and over again. And he provided purification for sins. Sin is one of those words that we try to avoid anymore because it's just not politically correct. And I get around it by just saying, you disobeyed God. Does that make you feel better? You didn't do what you're supposed to do. Does that make you feel better? That's what sin is. I either actively disobey or I neglect to do something I should do and I know better. The Bible says, for him who knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. That's an act of omission. When I just deliberately do it, that's an act of commission. But when I rebel against God, I dirty myself. I'm, I'm stained with guilt, which is a legal term means I must satisfy justice. And what I need is something. I need a, a guilt remover, you know? I go to a grocery store and you can find all kinds of, you know, Comet and cleansers and, you know, they got too many brands. I got to call home. Which one do you really want? They're giving me too many choices here. But I have never found one that says it'll cleanse my conscience or my heart or take away my sin. But I have in the Bible found what will do that. In 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, purifies us from all sin. So when I receive Jesus, I confess my sin. He takes his blood and he scrubs me clean. And I have no idea how that works. But Isaiah said it like this. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, as red as my, my, my tie. If your, skin, your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, extracts all my guilt away 
And I am given the righteousness of Jesus Christ when I believe. He is the purifier. He's the purifier. The seventh one in this passage is he's the finisher. He's the finisher. You see, he sat down. He's going to make an argument in the book of Hebrews that a priest's work was never done. Every day there was more sin, so he had to go deal with it. He had to go slice another animal's throat, take its blood, sprinkle it around the altar, and put its, you know, its carcass on the altar, burn it up to God. Every day, every day, day in, day out, they always did this. So they, there was no chair in the sanctuary. Because a priest never got to sit down. His work was never done. But Jesus, after he made purification for sin, he sat down because his work was done. It was finished. He's finished dealing with our sin. When Jesus was on the cross, every Good Friday we tell the story. The seven sayings of the Savior. And the sixth and seventh, he says, to tell us die. That's it. One Greek word. It's translated, it is finished. And then he gave up his, his spirit. He died. When he finished paying in full the price of our sin, it was all finished. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. And in heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, what he calls here the majesty on high. He's seated next to the Father on the throne because his work is done. In chapter 7 of Hebrews, it says, Now he ever lives to make intercession for us. When I pray, it goes to my high priest Jesus, and he just passes it right on to his Father, right next to us. <laughs> and the Father gives him the answer and brings it back to me. I have a relationship with God, and that's what this is all about. Because it is finished. It is finished. He said that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. I want you to think about this in this Christmas season. It's about God sending his son into the world to speak God's love into your life. The prophets spoke, the forefathers, they talked. And, but this is God sending his son to say, I love you. I'm enduring all that I'm enduring for you. I went to the cross for you. I died for you. I was buried for you. He's speaking his love to you. The second thing is, he's offering you an inheritance that's starting right now. You can have an abundant life right now. And not only abundant life right now, but then eternal life to come. Listen, he wants to expose you to the radiant glory of God. He wants you, as you search the scriptures, you'll find this glorious Savior and the more you get to know him, the more you, the, the glory of the Lord will begin to manifest itself in your life. And you'll begin to do those things that glorify him, whether it's eating or drinking or whatever you do. You'll start doing it for the glory of God. This Christmas, think about this. He came to show you who God really is. He is the express image of God. He's his exact being if you want to have a relationship with God, you must have a relationship with Jesus. You must. Next one. He is upholding everything. He, in him, everything consists. He's carrying his universe to where it's going. And he is actually working everything in your life together for good. Everything. And I don't know what, what it is in your life that you say, oh man, I can't believe this is happening to me. He's working everything together in your life for good. He's a purifier of your life from every stain of sin that you ever commit. You go to him, he'll scrub it clean. And he has finished what you started and messed up. He's finished by cleaning it up. Now listen, all this was wrapped up in a manger. This is Christmas. Isn't it amazing? This is Christmas. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are amazed at such a simple story. It seems so unbelievable to so many, but is packed with a glory that belongs only to you. 
a Savior is born, which is Christ the Lord. The Lord. In this Advent season, may we meditate on, Lord, your greatness of who you are and that you came into the world for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.